Hannelore Schmatz German-born mountaineer Hannelore Schmatz became the fourth woman to reach the summit of Mount Everest in 1979. The expedition was led by her 50-year-old husband, Gerhard Schmatz, who was the oldest man to reach the top of the mountain. They embarked on the journey with six other experienced climbers and five Sherpas, or local guides. Gerhard made the ascent first with some of the other group members. Hannelore's group's turn was next, but the weather was rapidly deteriorating and Gerhard tried to talk them out of going. They didn't listen and went anyway, and he soon received word that Hannelore had reached the summit. During her group's descent, Hannelore and fellow climber Ray Gennett became too exhausted to continue. They wanted to set up camp at 28,000 feet, 8,534 meters, but their guides cautioned against it because they were in the so-called death zone, where climbers are most likely to die. Gennett stayed and died of hypothermia, and Hannelore tried to make it down to the base camp. Not long after they continued the descent, Hannelore sat down, said, water, water, and died. Her body remained on the mountain for years to come. Mummified by the extreme cold, she haunted passers-by with her eyes wide open and her hair blowing in the wind, as if to warn them of the dangers that lie ahead. A gust of wind eventually blew her body off the side of the mountain and out of view. George Mallory George Mallory and fellow mountaineer Sandy Irvin vanished from the northeast ridge of Mount Everest during the 1924 British Mount Everest expedition. They were last seen about 800 feet 245 meters from the summit before they disappeared from sight. For the next 75 years, nobody knew what happened to Mallory. They just knew he was dead. In 1999, climbers discovered his body laying face down while filming a BBC documentary on the topic. His remains were remarkably well preserved due to the constant freezing temperatures on the mountain. Irvin's body was never found. There's a severed rope around Mallory's waist, indicating that he likely tumbled down the ridge, breaking one of his legs on the way down. His uninjured leg was found crossed over the broken limb, suggesting that he was alive for a brief period after the fall and attempting to protect the injured leg. Irvin's pickaxe was found near Mallory's remains. It's unknown whether the two men were tied together when Mallory fell and why Irvin's body was not discovered nearby. The team who discovered Mallory failed to find a camera that they believed he was carrying leading them to theorize that Irvin must have had it instead. If found, it's possible that the camera's film could still be developed, perhaps offering a first-hand glimpse of the ill-fated expedition. Lincoln Hall The first Australian expedition to climb Mount Everest took place in 1984, with the group forging a new path up the mountain along the way. Included among them was experienced climber Lincoln Hall, he wasn't one of the two group members to reach the summit, but he returned to Everest in 2006 to try again. This time he made it to the top, where he spent 20 minutes before beginning his descent. Shortly into the trip down, while still in the so-called death zone, Hall suffered from a form of altitude sickness called cerebral edema, which caused him to hallucinate and become confused. He began threatening to jump off cliffs and climb back up the mountain, and then collapsed in the snow. Sherpas tried for hours to revive Hall, but the expedition leader eventually instructed them to leave him behind and save themselves. A statement was released announcing Hall's death, and his family was notified. Twelve hours later, another group discovered the man alive while climbing the mountain. To their shock, he wasn't only alive, but was sitting up with his jacket unzipped. He was weak, delusional, and frostbitten, but had miraculously survived the night at an altitude of over 28,200 feet, 8,595 meters, without any oxygen. Hall calmly greeted the group, saying, I imagine you are surprised to see me here. He lost the tips of his fingers and a toe, but otherwise emerged in relatively good health. Sadly, Hall died in 2012 from mesothelioma. His climbing boots are on display at the National Museum of Australia. Francis Arsentiev Nicknamed the Sleeping Beauty of Mount Everest, Francis Arsentiev became the first American woman to summit the peak, 
without supplemental oxygen in 1998. She accomplished defeat with her husband, Sergei, but without the supplemental oxygen, it took the couple longer than usual to complete the journey to the top. On their way back down, the weather turned and Sergei lost sight of Francis. When he reached the base camp and realized she wasn't there, he grabbed an oxygen tank and went out searching for her. Not far from the summit, Francis had grown tired and sat down to rest. A climbing team from Uzbekistan found her weak and suffering from frostbite. She couldn't stand, so the most they could do to help her was give her a bottle of oxygen. The next day, climbers Cathy O'Dowd and Ian Woodall found Francis still alive but without oxygen and with some of her clothing removed due to the searing hot sensation that some people feel when they get hypothermia. Francis was repeating the same three phrases out loud, don't leave me, why are you doing this to me, and I'm an American. But she wasn't responding to the couple's questions and she couldn't move. Kathy and Ian tried to help, but they had no other choice than to leave Francis where they found her. Sergei's body was found a year later. It appeared as though he had taken a fall while he was out looking for his wife. Ian Woodall returned to Everest in 2007 with a specific mission to give Francis a proper burial. With help from his team members, he moved her body out of sight, covered her in an American flag, and placed a teddy bear next to her. Swang Paljor, Green Boots When people die on Mount Everest, their bodies are often left right where they took their last breath. The 200 bodies scattered throughout the mountain serve as sobering reminders to the climbers who walk past them of how easy it is to perish in the unforgiving Himalayan climate. One of the most famous bodies on Mount Everest is thought to belong to a man named Sewang Paljor. Nicknamed Green Boots, the corpse rests on its side with Paljor's face concealed by his fleece and his arms wrapped around his torso, as if to protect himself from the harsh cold. It's impossible not to notice his vibrant green footwear, especially since they lay in the path, forcing climbers to step over the body. Hailing from India, Paljor was one of eight people who died on the mountain during a blizzard in 1996. Fellow team member Harbhajan Singh was the only one to survive the expedition. He stayed alive by cautiously remaining behind when he realized how dangerous the conditions were getting near the top but the rest of the group pushed on, consumed by the obsessive desire to reach the peak, known as Summit Fever. Three of the climbers accomplished their goal, but they paid for it with their lives when they died in the blizzard. Have you heard the stories of Mount Everest climbers experiencing Summit Fever? What about climbers using the bodies of previous hikers as waypoints on the climb? Let me know in the comments and make sure to like and subscribe while you're there. David Sharp The obsession that many climbers have with reaching the top of Mount Everest, known as Summit Fever, is one of numerous ethical issues that have come under increasing scrutiny in recent years. Some people are so determined to accomplish their goal that they ignore others who are in need of help along the way, or fail to pay attention to their own body's warning signs that it's time to quit or take a break. David Sharp was an experienced British climber who made a solo attempt to summit Mount Everest in 2006, without any oxygen, minus a very small emergency supply. It was his third expedition up the mountain, and he hoped to finally reach the peak this time. Before leaving for the trip, Sharp reassured his mother that there would be plenty of other climbers around to help him if he needed it. It's unknown whether he reached the summit, but he definitely at least came close. During the descent back toward base camp, Sharp was forced to camp out under a rock shelter at an altitude of around 28,000 feet, 8,500 meters. His emergency oxygen supply was depleted and he may have been having equipment issues when he was overtaken by the elements. Quite a bit of time passed before anyone noticed that Sharp was overdue for his return to the base camp, and nobody panicked at first. Knowing he was an experienced mountaineer, other climbers assumed that Sharp had the situation under control, but he couldn't get up to resume his journey and died near the famous Green Boots corpse that's been resting on the mountain since 1996. Dozens of climbers passed by Sharp in the hours leading up to his death. At times, he was lucid and coherent, 
Others, he appeared to be asleep or unconscious. Several people stopped to give him oxygen and try to help him, but there was little anyone could do when they were traveling with limited supplies and putting their own life at risk. Sir Edmund Hillary, the first explorer to summit Mount Everest in 1953, criticized the 30 to 40 climbers who reportedly passed by Sharp for not doing more to help him. Many others felt the same way, believing that people were too preoccupied with reaching the summit to stop and help a dying man. Surprisingly, Sharp's mother feels differently. She told reporters that a climber's responsibility is to save themselves and nobody else. What do you think? Do climbers have a moral obligation to stop and help a stranded mountaineer, or is it every person for themselves? Shriya Shah Chlorphene Overcrowding is increasingly becoming an issue on Mount Everest, where more and more people have died in recent years due to congestion slowing down their journey. Deaths also seem to be on the rise, as climbing packages are offered to almost anyone willing to pay for a journey that was once reserved for only the most experienced climbers. Shriya Shah Chlorphene was born in Nepal but lived in Canada. Climbing to the top of Mount Everest was her lifelong dream. In 2012, she booked her spot on an expedition with a new company. Neither Shriya nor the company had much experience. During her training, it became apparent that Shriya would lag behind the group. She had to be taught even the most basic things. One of the Sherpas forewarned her against climbing Everest, telling her that she could end up killing herself if she tried. But Shriya was determined to accomplish her goal, and she went anyway. To top it all off, the mountain was overcrowded with climbers on the day her group ascended to the summit. Shriya started running low on oxygen on the way up. In addition to the long wait time to get up and down the mountain, she spent 25 minutes at the summit using even more oxygen while she took pictures and videos. During the climb down, Shriya became weak from exhaustion and altitude sickness and needed to be held up by the Sherpas. Anytime she tried taking a step, she fell. At some point, Shriya stopped moving. She passed away at over 26,000 feet, 8,000 meters, after uttering the final words, save me, to one of the Sherpas. Her body was draped with a Canadian flag and was retrieved 10 days later. Veteran climbing guide Russell Bryce told reporters that Shriya used her oxygen earlier than most climbers and that she kept it flowing at a higher rate. She was given a big enough supply to get up the mountain, but not to make it back down. Bryce also pointed out that people tend to get the wrong impression that Everest is easy to climb because so many people do it nowadays. Scott Fisher Scott Fisher was a highly experienced mountaineer and guide who preferred to climb without using supplemental oxygen. He first climbed Mount Everest in 1994 as part of a team that removed 5,000 pounds, 2,268 kilograms of trash from the mountain. Two years later, Fisher, two other guides, and eight Sherpas led an expedition of eight climbers up Everest. Slowed down by the high number of climbers on the mountain, Fisher reached the summit later in the day than recommended for a safe turnaround. On his way back down, he grew increasingly sick, weak, and tired. When a blizzard set in, Fisher sent his Sherpa along without him, asking him to return later on with help. By the time help arrived two days later, Fisher was unresponsive. Rescuers put an oxygen mask on his face and went to help others, hoping he'd regain consciousness at some point. But when they returned, it was clear that Fisher was dead. He was partially undressed, which is known to sometimes happen when someone suffers from hypothermia or altitude-related delirium. The rest of the expedition members survived the ordeal. Fisher's legacy lives on in Mountain Madness, the mountain climbing company he founded that helps curious adventurers reach the peak of their dreams. Marco Sofredi French snowboarder Marco Sofredi was just 23 years old when he climbed Mount Everest in 2002 in search of the holy grail of snowboarding routes. With the help of three Sherpas, he reached the summit without any issues. He spent several hours resting and preparing for his unconventional descent while dreary weather set in. 
The Sherpas urged Sifredi to set up camp and wait until the next day to snowboard down the mountain, but he ignored their advice. The guides hurried to beat the storm that was coming. Once they broke the cloud cover, they saw a lone figure off in the distance below, but there were no marks in the snow once the Sherpas reached the area where they had seen the figure. Sifredi was never seen or heard from again, and he's presumed dead. His sister believes that he survived the descent and decided to start a new life living with yak herders, but it's more likely that he succumbed to exhaustion and fell into a ravine or was swallowed by an avalanche. An ancient horse. If you love horses, then you will love this discovery. Archaeologists have recently found the skeleton of an ancient horse in England. It was actually found in a pit from an old gravel quarry, and the horse lived during Roman times, about 2,000 years ago. The horse was also found surrounded by fragments of pottery and scraps from other animals. It was probably buried somewhere on the edge of what was once a large settlement. Allison Dickens with Cambridge Archaeology Unit says that all signs in this discovery point to Roman activity. The horse suffered a broken leg, though that probably isn't what led to its death. The archaeologists were able to see evidence of healing, meaning the horse hadn't died until much later. That's pretty rare, right? Usually if a horse breaks its leg, it's game over. What ultimately killed this ancient horse remains a mystery, but there is a great deal of other information researchers can glean from this incredible discovery. One of the other theories is that this incredible horse could have been a member of the Roman cavalry called the Auxilia. These cavalry units were deployed along the flanks of the infantry to protect them from enemy attack. As for the actual origin of the horse, researchers are still trying to figure that out. We know that Romans liked horses from Parthia, Media, Armenia, Libya, and even Persia. The horse could have come from any of these places, or an as-of-yet undiscovered region. Researchers will continue to examine this interesting find and try to learn more about how humans and horses interacted some 2,000 years ago. Bootlegger Whiskey When Nick Drummond and Patrick Backer were going through the process of buying a house at the edge of the small New York village called Ames, they heard all kinds of rumors that it had once belonged to a bootlegger in the 1920s. The house, built in 1915, could have indeed belonged to a bootlegger, they thought, but they dismissed the talk as merely a rumor. They didn't give the story as much more thought, at least not until October. When Nick ripped off the old and rotten skirting around the mudroom, something fell out at his feet. He thought it was a chunk of insulation, but soon realized it was a package. The brown paper package appeared old, possibly dating to the 1920s. It contained six glass bottles of whiskey, each one wrapped by itself with straw. It turned out that the house really did belong to a bootlegger over 100 years ago, and some of his stash was left behind. After discovering the first package full of booze, Nick and Patrick investigated further. They uncovered a hidden hatch that led to a secret storage place beneath the floor. They found a total of 100 bottles of what back then had been illegal Gallic whiskey from Scotland. After doing a bit of investigation, it turns out the former homeowner was a man named Count Adolf Humpfner. He died under suspicious circumstances in 1932, collapsing dead in the living room of his home. It seems nobody ever found his booze stash in the mudroom. Pretty fascinating. Not only did this couple discover a bootlegger's 100-year-old stash of alcohol, but the mysterious death as well? What would you do if your home had these kinds of mysteries? Let me know in the comments below. Giant Head in a Chinese Well One of the most fascinating discoveries made recently was the skull of a very old person at the bottom of a Chinese well. It's such an amazing discovery that archaeologists are literally being forced to rethink evolution as we know it. It's because the skull has revealed to scientists a new branch of the human family tree, an ancient hominid that more closely resembled modern humans than our very distant relatives, the Neanderthals. The skull is huge, which is just one reason the Chinese researchers named it Homo longi, or the Dragon Man. Chris Stringer, a professor at the Natural History Museum in London, called it one of the most important discoveries of the past half century. The skull was originally uncovered in 1933 by Chinese laborers. The Chinese workers were under the rule of the Japanese occupying forces at the time, 
So to keep the skull hidden from the Japanese, it was stashed in an abandoned well. It didn't resurface again until 2018, when the very man who hid it told his grandson about it before he died. The skull has been dated back at least 146,000 years. But the reason it's so amazing is that it possesses a unique combination of features between more primitive hominids and modern ones. Its face actually resembles our own, although its head and body would have been substantially larger, just like those of our ancient hominid cousins, the Neanderthals. One might think of the Dragon Man as the missing link, a bridge between our Neanderthal cousins and what we are today, making the revelation of this discovery pretty epic. Civilization Under a Lake Experts recently discovered proof of an ancient civilization hidden underneath a lake in the country of Kyrgyzstan. The old settlement was occupied some 25 centuries ago, though so now it's submerged beneath Lake Isik Kul in the Kyrgyz mountains. The truly fascinating part is that the experts are saying this mysterious civilization was equally as advanced as the Hellenistic civilizations of the Mediterranean, comparable to ancient Greece. Another incredible aspect is just how little this discovery has been reported. Kyrgyz historians, Russian researchers, and teams of scientists were investigating the submerged civilization for years. They have uncovered huge walls under the water stretching for over 1,500 feet. Everything points to a large city that 2,500 years ago would have been considered a large metropolis. But the ruins of the city were not all they found. They also uncovered burial mounds from the ancient Scythians, preserved artifacts like battle axes, daggers, and even an entire gold bar. The region has played a key role in humanity ever since it began. Archaeologists have found traces of Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, and even Zoroastrianism, one of the oldest religions in the world. The Silk Road also ran along the shores of Lake Isuk Kul until the 18th century. As for who built the underwater city, that is still a mystery. A lot of different tribes and peoples moved in and out of the region. At some point in history, when the lake was empty, the civilization built their city on its bed. Years later, the city flooded and the people were gone, but the wealth of archaeological knowledge contained beneath the lake continues to fascinate. Fast Dinosaurs In a bizarre new dinosaur discovery, it turns out carnivorous dinos were so fast, they could sprint at speeds comparable to a modern car. This amazing discovery comes thanks to footprints left behind by theropods as they ran across the lake bed tens of millions of years ago. At La Rioja in Spain, you know, the famous wine region, two sets of fossilized footprints were found by paleontologists. Whichever creature made these tracks was moving at an outstanding speed of 27.7 miles per hour. And apparently, based on the study of the fossilized prints, the dinosaur sped up as it was running. The footprints were left behind sometime during the Cretaceous period, between 145 and 66 million years ago. Researchers are unclear as to which species of theropod left them behind, but we do know it had three toes, was at least seven feet tall, and would have measured somewhere around 16 feet from the tip of its snout to the bottom of its tail. These creatures were also non-avian, were extraordinarily agile, and faster than ever believed possible. Are you surprised to learn that dinosaurs could travel at such high speeds? Let me know in the comments. The Immortal Hydra Scientists have discovered how small aquatic animals called hydras are able to regrow lost heads, just like the monster from Greek mythology. Apparently, the mythological hydra is real. It's just extremely small. Its body is nothing more than a tiny cylinder tipped with a foot-like appendage on one end and a mouth at the other, with tentacles spilling out of it. What's amazing is that the hydra can regrow any part of its body that's been cut off even growing an entirely new animal from a severed piece of tissue. In lab experiments, scientists have demonstrated how the hydra can regrow its own cells indefinitely. This means, for all intents and purposes, the hydra is immortal. While something that ultimately extinguished the life and body of the entire creature at once would certainly kill it, as far as regeneration goes, the hydra can live on forever. Scientists have even identified the gene activity that goes on during the growth of a replacement head. When the hydra has its head cut off, cells at the top of its body send signals to cells at the stump, 
telling them to begin forming the tissue needed for regrowth. And now that scientists know how it's done, they just need to figure out how to replicate it in humans, which would be an incredible medical advance for organs. But that would just be the tip of the iceberg. Imagine if you could grow back your whole body from just a limb. How would that work? Would there be two of you? I have so many questions. And now it's shout out time. I wanted to give a big thank you to Karma Lee Nash and Minazaki. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Neanderthal Death Rites 70,000 years ago, a Neanderthal died and was buried in Shanidar Cave in what is today Iraq. All these years later, the skeleton of this Neanderthal was uncovered by modern archaeologists revealing a fascinating story. This wasn't the only Neanderthal found inside the cave. The remains of 10 other Neanderthals were found there in the 1950s. Their skeletons were carved out of the cave and then transported to the Baghdad Museum on the roof of a taxi. This newest Neanderthal was found during excavations that took place between 2016 and 2019. Archaeologists now believe that this cave may have been a type of burial ground for Neanderthals. The skeleton was found in front of a triangular rock placed near the skull, which may have been used as a grave marker. Plus, additional bodies were found nearby, all of them positioned in a row, as you'd find in a typical cemetery. What makes this discovery particularly revealing is that Neanderthals, 70,000 years ago, were thought to be largely primitive cave people. The very fact that they began to respect their dead by burying them in the backs of caves is outstanding. It means that human ingenuity, spirituality, and even a fundamental understanding of life and death began to develop over 60,000 years before we even tried to build a city. It means the Neanderthals, although now extinct, were part of a complex culture with far more complicated thoughts and ideals than we have ever given them credit for. Yemen's Well of Hell In the country of Yemen, there is a rather disturbing place known as the Well of Hell. And for the first time, researchers have made some pretty shocking discoveries deep inside of it. In legends and folklore, local people say the enormous pit is a prison for genies, and even a gateway into the dark and dank underworld. And when viewing this incredible site, you really can't be surprised. This unusual place in the middle of the desert is an almost otherworldly pit, leading into what appears to be some dismal foreboding abyss. But what's really inside this well? Cave explorers from Oman decided to answer the question by becoming the first people to descend to the bottom of the 367-foot hole. While explorers have gone into the hole before, no one has ever reached the bottom until now. The team members filmed the whole thing, while a small crowd of local spectators gathered to see if any genies might fly out. Rather than genies, the explorers, including Mohammed Al-Kindi from the University of Technology in Oman, found waterfalls, creepy snakes, dead animals, and even cave pearls. The hole has been around for millions of years, just an ordinary sinkhole that happens to look extremely out of place. The explorers also found frogs and beetles, and the bodies of birds that somehow got stuck in the pit and couldn't get out. In fact, Al-Kindi told local news that the smell from all the dead animals filled the sinkhole and made it overwhelming, almost impossible to handle. Can you imagine? A giant planet Scientists have recently discovered a very large and very odd planet, one that orbits around a pair of bright stars that we can see with our own eyes in the southern sky. The planet is actually so strange that scientists can hardly believe it. The planet is located in B Centauri, a double star system 325 light years from us. The planet is made up of gas about 11 times bigger than Jupiter, with an orbit that is 100 times wider than Jupiter's. It also happens to be orbiting a star over three times bigger than the Sun, making it the first gas giant planet of its kind ever found. It was Marcus Johnson and his team at the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope who made the discovery while surveilling the star system. The planet has been named Sen ABB, and it doesn't actually orbit one of its two stars, but rather the shared center of mass between them. It also happens to be orbiting at a distance of 560 times where we are from our own star. That's an incredibly far orbit to have, adding yet another point to the list of oddities. 
This enormous raging ball of hydrogen and helium around a small rock core is causing quite the ruckus, since scientists say it shouldn't even exist in the first place. An Origin of Horses It was roughly 4,200 years ago that humans learned how to ride horses. This brilliant realization allowed people to travel greater distances than ever before, creating a sudden boom of migration throughout Asia and Europe. And for thousands of years after, horses played a critical role in our societies. They farmed, helped warriors in battle, and are just generally great. But for a long time, scientists have been wondering just where domestic horses came from. After a collaboration with over 100 scientists, they believe they've found the answer. It looks like horses came from southern Russia. According to Ludovic Orlando, the leader of the study and a molecular archaeologist, this is the birthplace of the domesticated horse. The team reconstructed ancient genomes from horse skeletons found all the way from Portugal to Mongolia, and one particular region in the south of Russia appeared to be the oldest. What this means, at least what we think it means, is that one particular group of mysterious people began to breed horses specifically for domestication. They began moving to new places with their domestic horses, these horses bred with other horses, and they spread across the globe. The Trunyan Cemetery In the traditional Balinese village of Trunyan, there is a cemetery where dead people are not actually buried. It's one of the most terrifying places you can visit on the planet, especially if you aren't used to this. The villagers don't cremate their dead. They don't burn them on a pyre or throw them in the river or leave them on a hill to be ripped apart by birds. And they don't bury them in coffins. They don't even mummify them and leave them around the village like some other cultures in Asia. Instead, they leave their dead out in the open in cages. It's called the Trunyan Cemetery and it contains 11 bamboo cages. When somebody in the village dies, their body is wrapped in a white cloth and then placed into one of the cages. There, nature takes control. When one of these cages is full, the body that's been in there the longest will be taken out and the remains put in a pile with other ancient corpses. But we're not done with this strange and very complex ritual yet. This pile of corpses is then monitored until a certain set of bones is completely bare. Once a skeleton has lost all its flesh and fat and muscle and has nothing except shiny white bone remaining, the skull is taken and put beneath a monstrous Tarumenian tree. And there you can find hundreds of skulls dating back centuries. Suffice it to say, it doesn't smell that great. Crushed by Napoleon In 2017, archaeologists dug up a mass grave of soldiers who were defeated by Napoleon's troops back in July of 1809. The grave was discovered in Austria, underneath the topsoil of a farmer's field in a tiny town near Vienna. Underneath this seemingly innocent field were the bodies of roughly 55,000 soldiers. These soldiers perished when troops under the order of Napoleon Bonaparte came through on the warpath. They belonged to the Austrian army that fought back against Napoleon during the Battle of Wagram. The mass graves were dug in haste. The French soldiers didn't care enough to dig more than shallow pits in the ground and dump as many bodies as would fit. Archaeologists have also discovered musket balls, buttons, and thousands of random personal items that were dropped during the battle and left behind. But perhaps the biggest shock is just how unhealthy most of the soldiers were before they died in battle. Archaeologists have turned to biology, examining the bones of the soldiers to see what ailed them. Out of 50 skeletons analyzed so far, almost all of them have shown traces of scurvy from a sickening vitamin C deficiency. They all had inflammation of their joints from long marches while carrying their weapons and supplies. Plus, many of them were suffering from pneumonia infections even as they fought for their lives. It shows a pretty disturbing reality of ancient combat. These weren't battle-hardened warriors, but sickened youngsters between 16 and 30 on the verge of death even before they picked up their guns. Evidence of a Roman Crucifixion In the United Kingdom, sometime in the 3rd or 4th century AD, a man was crucified. He had a nail hammered through his heel bones and was left to die on a cross. Experts say he was most likely a slave, killed between the ages of 25 and 30. Judging by how thin his leg bones were, researchers presume he was chained to a wall for a significant amount of time before his crucifixion, which was a popular death penalty during that time. 
This is according to David Ingham with Albion Archaeology in England, who led the excavation that discovered these horrifying remains. Evidence of the crucifixion was discovered in a cemetery which contained the graves of 48 people. All of them showed signs of very hard manual labor throughout their life. This has led researchers to believe they were probably all local slaves used by the invading Romans. A workshop was also found nearby that had been used to make soap and other household items. What's truly amazing is that there have been pretty much no other examples of crucifixion found throughout Europe, probably because they were done with organic materials like wood and rope that leaves nothing behind. Only one other 100% verified example was discovered in 1968 in a tomb in Jerusalem. That makes this the second verified crucifixion a practice that's believed to have begun with the Babylonians. It was actually used all the way up until about 1400 years ago by the Persians. They tied their victims to trees or posts, but it was the Romans who used crosses. This individual would have had his hands tied to the cross and his feet nailed to the ground. It would have been extremely difficult to breathe in such a position, and the man would have eventually suffocated. Irish Hell Cave in the middle of a field in Ireland is a large mound surrounded by sheep. 2,000 years ago, this mound was the site where Celtic pagans danced and chanted in a celebration which would become the birth of Halloween. The Celtic people believed the nearby Owain Nagat cave was a passage between their world and the underworld, a place infested with devils. It was here where they held the very first Samhain festival. What we know today as the original ritual that morphed into the Halloween we know and love. Irish archaeologist Daniel Curley says the Irish Samhain festival was not quite as child-friendly as our Halloween is now. It was instead a bloody and scary ritual in which animals were sacrificed at a massive pagan temple erected beside the Irish Hell Cave. Nobody is sure exactly how it happened, but we do know it was at the mound now surrounded by fields and sheep. People came from all over Ireland to celebrate Samhain, the ending of summer and the beginning of autumn. They celebrated with blood, food, and arranged marriages. It was also during the festival that they would make declarations of war. Not much is left of the temples and feasting grounds now, except a few pieces of crumbling stonework overgrown by grass. You know, for the sheep to eat. Fast forward to the 1800s. The age-old tradition of Samhain, born here at the cave, was brought by Irish immigrants to the United States. From there, it turned into American Halloween. Did you know that the Irish were the true creators of Halloween in the United States? Let me know in the comments below. Bloody Medieval Warfare On July 22, 1361, the King of Denmark sent an army of over 2,500 men to the west coast of Gotland to utterly obliterate the population. Gotland is a small island about 40 miles from the Swedish mainland. It had been a major trading hub between the kingdoms of Europe and Russia for centuries. The walled town of Visby had been growing richer and richer for hundreds of years, but the king of Denmark was not too happy about all this. He didn't like that the city of Visby was becoming so rich, that its citizens were spreading into rural areas, and that it was becoming a direct threat to him and his empire. So he did what any king that felt threatened would do he decided to destroy it. The citizens of Visby closed their gate. 1,800 peasants gathered their arms and were ready to fight against the king, Valdemar IV's army. But they were utterly annihilated. It was one of the bloodiest battles in European history. The Danish soldiers slaughtered the old and the young alike and threw their corpses into mass graves. 700 years later, these graves have been discovered. At least four huge pits full of medieval bones were found within what was once the walled city of Visby. The remains are ghoulish to say the least. 1,185 human remains have been taken out of the pits so far, most of them savaged by weapons such as swords and axes. People also suffered piercing wounds from arrows and lances. They had been brutalized with morning stars, bashed to bits with huge metal spikes, Maces and warhammers had crushed helmets and skulls alike. Bodies were even found with daggers still stabbed through their skulls. What happened here was extremely shocking. Alipotripa Cave The Alipotripa Cave overlooks a quiet bay in Greece. Within this cave, archaeologists have made all kinds of amazing discoveries, including the remains of a village from the Stone Age, 
burials dating back 7,000 years, a small lake, and a hidden chamber in the back about as large as an amphitheater. Thousands of years ago, this cave chamber was used in some seriously spooky rituals, which perhaps could have led to the myth of Hades. Yet all of these incredible discoveries had been sealed from the world since the days of classical Greece, that is, until just recently. It was only a few years ago that Greek archaeologists managed to make their way through the mouth of the cave, where they have since discovered roughly 160 burials spanning from between 5000 and 3200 BC. Humans loved this cave for almost 2000 years. The cave is like a snapshot from the dawn of European civilization. Archaeologists believe there was a large village outside of the cave, with a smaller village inside. There was definitely ritual activity, since the cave is covered in a layer of greasy ash left behind by fires. It shows that while Stone Age farmers were finally setting up their own settlements in the Mediterranean and practicing agriculture, they still clung to the ways of their cave-dwelling ancestors. They buried their dead in the dark and dank recesses of the cave, and some even preferred to live inside it. All that only came to an end because the entrance collapsed. It sealed off a small portion of history, leaving it in perfect condition for us to study today. Extra Skulls In California, archaeologists made a very ghoulish discovery at an ancient cemetery. They uncovered physical evidence of a very macabre practice which involved community members being buried with small collections of severed heads. The excavations were done in Marsh Creek, with archaeologists digging up eight graves that had trophy heads buried with the bodies of the deceased. By trophy heads, I'm talking about heads taken from defeated enemies and then kept as trophies by ancient warriors. In the area, archaeologists also happened to find seven different skeletons who had had their heads removed. It's very likely that these skeletons were the victims and their heads were the trophies. But just wait one second, because Dr. Jelmer Erkins from the University of California believes the skulls may have a different origin. He says maybe they weren't trophies in the traditional sense. Dr. Erkins believes these skulls may have belonged to the buried people's mothers. He goes on to explain that taking a head in human society has always been a powerful symbol. Trophy heads were a show of power, and being buried with the skull of one's mother may have been a show of respect and great honor. Sadly, there is just no way to know for sure what happened here so long ago. Marsh Creek is home to over 500 burials dating back from between 7,000 and 3,000 years ago. Yet only 15 of the 400 were found with extra skulls in their burial plots. Bronze Age Tomb Romanian historians have discovered a series of Bronze Age tombs between around 3000 to 1600 BC full of bodies. Nine almost perfectly preserved tombs thousands of years old were uncovered at an archaeological site where the Thracians had once built a mighty city before it was taken over by the Romans. Inside these mysterious and creepy tombs, the researchers excavated bronze pieces of jewelry like bracelets and necklaces. They also found ceramic vessels unique to Bronze Age Romania. The objects prove that the local Thracians were participating in trade with societies as far away as northern Germany. The burials of the people inside also show that the Thracians may have been culturally influenced by civilizations further in the east. It's an important discovery because in Romania, there just aren't that many necropolises from the Bronze Age which makes it tough to understand what the ancient people here were doing. What we do know is that the area around what is today Bucharest was occupied as early as 4000 BC. A group called the Monteru settled in the hills. The Thracians eventually rose to power, and just when things were looking up, the Romans came in and destroyed everything and took all the people for their slaves. Ancient Cave Remains Archaeologists working with the University of Barcelona in Spain discovered proof of a very rare Neolithic death ritual. The proof came in the form of the remains of four people hidden in the back of a lonely cave. One adult, one teenager, and two children between the ages of three and six. All four individuals have been dated back to 6,400 years ago. What's unusual is that all of them had been placed in fetal positions bound together with rope, and then all four were wrapped in a shroud. According to Manuel Edo, the director of the excavations, they were likely left in the cave like this because it's the same position they were in when they first arrived on Earth. Other than the human remains, 
The archaeologists also discovered fragments of bones from goats and a calf. They also found a bone pendant beneath the elbow of the man, and what was left of a nearby bonfire. The bonfire had likely been lit during the funeral rites. These rites have never been seen anywhere else on the Iberian Peninsula before. Archaeologists don't know if it was a one-time deal, with the deceased all being strung together in a gruesome web of rope. Perhaps it was a popular way to dispose of entire dead families back when people in Spain were still living in caves. The Oldest Human Burial In Africa, a spectacular yet sad discovery has been made. Spectacular because archaeologists say they've identified the oldest known human burial on the continent. Sad because the remains belong to a child that had been laid to rest in a neat grave 80,000 years ago. The child was just three years old at the time of death. She was placed with her legs tucked against her chest, wrapped in a shroud with her head laid gently on a pillow. She was then covered in soil and left in the earth. She was discovered by archaeologists as they excavated the floor at the mouth of the Panga Ya Saidi cave in Kenya. Looking beyond the horror of digging up a young girl's bones, this is one of the most amazing discoveries ever made in Africa. Professor of Human Evolution Michael Petraglia called it spectacular, confirming it as the oldest human burial in Africa. The professor says it's a look back at our societal behaviors at the very beginning of our species' existence. Even back then, when humans first became humans, we cared so much about one another, especially the young among us, that we took the time to respectfully bury the dead. 70,000 years before a human being ever lived in a proper house, we still had the right moral values to bury our deceased loved ones. Someone even placed the young girl's head on a pillow so that she was comfortable in her final resting place. Giant Carcass A sea monster the size of a double-decker bus was discovered washed up on the coast of England. The enormous corpse measured a whopping 33 feet long, stranded on the rocky shore of North Devon. It was first spotted by residents on the jagged rocks at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The residents reported the strange creature to the local whale and dolphin hotline, not having any idea what the mysterious beast was. As it turned out, the carcass actually belonged to a dead fin whale, the second largest mammal living on the planet. And if you thought this corpse was big, it's nothing compared to a fully grown adult. Fin whales can grow to be over 88 feet long and weigh as much as 130 tons. Sadly, we don't know what happened to this monster of the deep. Its skin was already extremely decomposed, suggesting it had already been deceased for quite some time. It was actually kind of sad to see it on the rocks and no longer alive. And since fin whales are technically an endangered species, that just makes it all the more tragic. Stephen Marsh of the British Divers Marine Life Rescue told news reporters that nobody knows where it came from. It apparently could have washed up from anywhere, as it probably died out at sea and then was gradually pushed toward the shore. As for the cause of death, nobody knows. The huge whale could have died from old age, been struck by a vessel, tangled in a fishing net, or could have died from some unknown disease. Whatever caused the death, this unusual creature certainly gave the locals quite a cause for concern. Death Star Monster Scientists in Antarctica have discovered a terrifying monster of the deep that they've nicknamed the Death Star. This bizarre freak of nature has 50 limbs and is quite frankly terrifying. The scientists stumbled upon this strange life form hidden beneath the ice shelves of Antarctica. James Smith from the British Antarctic Survey, along with his team members, drilled into nearly 3,000 feet of ice to below the Filchner Ron ice shelf. They then dropped a camera through the hole to see what they could find on the seabed. Much to their surprise, they found 16 marine sponges and 22 unidentified creatures. The Death Star was among the unidentified, at least at first. The animal, like I already said, has 50 arms. Except, what I failed to mention is that each arm is covered with small pincers that snap shut automatically when anything moves past them. It's like an automated hunting system. If something small gets close, the pincer will grab it so that the blob-like monster can swiftly devour it. It basically has 50 fishing rod arms. And while the scientists at first didn't know what the creature was, they soon identified it as an Antarctic sun starfish. The ancient creature is an invertebrate, 
one that has dominated the ocean floor for over 250 million years in one form or another. The scientists said that looking at the animals beneath the ice sheet was like traveling back in time. The Great and Terrible Kraken Professor Mark McMenamin, a man who happens to be a paleontologist at the Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, claims to have discovered proof that the mythical kraken really did exist, or at least some kind of octopus-like sea monster the size of a bus. You may have heard tales of the mythical kraken, the tentacled sea beast that was rumored to have destroyed entire ships. People have since been telling stories of the kraken since the 12th century in Norway. Mark claims that by inspecting the wounds found on the fossil of an ancient ichthyosaur, he has confirmed the kraken's existence. The fossil of the prehistoric beast was found with sucker markings on its bones, suggesting it had been drowned and that it had its neck snapped by the biggest octopus that has yet to be proven existed. This would have happened sometime between 250 and 90 million years before today. He made this discovery while looking at the remains of nine ichthyosaurs excavated from the Berlin Ichthyosaur State Park in Nevada. Mark found evidence that the creatures, kind of like whale-crocodile hybrids, had been carried away from where they were killed. He believes that whatever this creature was that strangled and drowned the huge reptiles had a lair deep underwater. But unfortunately, this is all just theory right now. Mark hasn't actually been able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that a monstrous kraken really did prowl the ocean millions of years ago, but perhaps it wasn't a giant squid at all, but an enormous octopus. Washed up monster in San Diego. An extremely rare beast of the deep sea has washed up on a beach in San Diego, California. The creature was identified as a Pacific football fish, a type of anglerfish that you might remember from the movie Finding Nemo. It's the terrifying creature that has a bioluminescent light fixed to the top of its head, which it uses as a lure for hunting. The creature was first discovered by a local San Diego man as he walked along Black's Beach. It was almost sunset and he was enjoying the quiet atmosphere when he found a literal nightmare of a creature. Of course, it was dead and so it couldn't sink its huge teeth into him. But according to the man named Jay Byler, he had never before seen an organism quite as fearsome as this one. He actually thought it was a jellyfish at first, until he realized it had a mouth filled with teeth that looked to be stained with blood. It was only about a foot long, but still scary enough. Jay snapped a couple of photographs and sent the pictures to NBC7 San Diego. From there, the story went viral. Ben Frabel, an expert on marine vertebrates, came forward to identify the anglerfish as one of the bigger species. Ben says it's only been spotted a few times in California and lives primarily in the deepest parts of the Pacific Ocean. And now for number 6, but first, it's shout out time! Want to give a big thank you to Tammy Moore and Lone Wolf Nerjigansi for supporting this channel! Thanks so much for watching and if you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! An Extinct Monster Shark There is nothing quite as terrifying as the Megalodon. The extinct monster shark that lived between 23 million and 2 million years ago. But what you might not know about this fierce predator is that it left a lot of its teeth behind. Several teeth from a dead megalodon were just found in the Atacama Desert of Chile. Experts say that even though treasure hunters have been pillaging the area in search of these valuable teeth, the desert still has the largest collection of megalodon remains in the world, specifically leftover chompers. And these are some big teeth I'm talking about. The word megalodon literally translates to big teeth. It was the biggest shark that ever swam through the waters of the world's oceans. The super predator could grow anywhere from 52 to 66 feet long. That's according to Pablo Quilodran with Atacama Paleontology and Natural History Research and Advancement Corps. The majority of giant shark teeth found in the South American desert are about 8 million years old. As for how big the teeth are, many can be upwards of 7 inches long. And one more thing, megalodons weren't the only sea monsters prowling the ocean millions of years ago when the desert was underwater. Researchers have found at least 25 different shark species that lived here, all of which were sea monsters in their own way. Deep Sea Cannibal San Diego seems to be a favorite spot for bizarre monsters from the deep ocean. Literally the week after the terrifying Pacific football fish washed up on the shore, another curious specimen also washed up in San Diego. This time it happened near the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, near La Jolla Shores. The sea monster was identified as a cannibalistic lancet fish. 
and it was actually alive. It's true that the lancet fish isn't quite as rare as the angler fish, but it is just as interesting. According to Dr. Elin Portner, who has been studying the contents of lancet fish stomachs, they do indeed enjoy eating members of their own species. The scientists found that once a lancet fish reaches about three feet in length, they begin hunting other lancet fish. The big mystery is that nobody seems to know why they wait so long before turning into cannibals. And another curious thing, the lancet fish is a simultaneous hermaphrodite. This means it's both male and female at the same time, possessing both reproductive organs. They can reproduce by themselves instead of relying on a partner. In theory, this monster could literally impregnate itself and then give birth to its own dinner. Yikes. Have you ever heard of an animal that is capable of reproducing alone? Pretty strange sea monster, huh? Let me know what you think in the comments below. 20th Century Sea Serpent A series of bizarre sea serpent sightings were made by fishermen back in the 1920s and 30s off the coast of East Yorkshire, England. Particularly, the sightings were made in the North Sea and Humber, with trawler men reporting an enormous and still unidentified creature lurking in the water. It's been 100 years since the strange sightings, and still nobody knows what it was all these fishermen were seeing. And to make matters worse, the descriptions of the beast vary intensely. The only thing all descriptions had in common was that the creature was enormous. The first sighting came back in August of 1922, when a steam trawler encountered something strange just 35 miles from the coast. The crew actually thought they saw sails from a pair of fishing boats, but as they got closer, they realized the sails were dorsal fins. And there wasn't just one creature, there were two of them. They estimated these monsters to be about 50 feet in length. The crew also testified that they definitely were not whales or sharks, which they were used to seeing. Around this same time, a creature described as a giant octopus or squid was found washed up on the beach very near to where the two monsters were sighted. The creature was only about six feet, but it was a monstrous sight to the locals who had never seen something so terrifying before. Then in July of 1929, a couple walking along the seafront saw what they described as a serpent slithering through the water at unbelievable speed. They claimed it definitely wasn't a porpoise, but something else entirely. These sightings continued on until the 1940s when they seemingly stopped, and to this day, we don't know if it was just hysteria or if there really was a crew of sea monsters terrorizing the shorelines for nearly two decades. Shipwreck Monster Explorers were left in absolute shock after they discovered a giant and mysterious sea creature while investigating a shipwreck. The shipwreck was at a depth of 2,800 feet. Naturally, the explorers weren't expecting some kind of sea monster to swim directly in front of them. The explorers were also scientists, part of a program with OceanX to conduct an ecosystem survey at the bottom of the Northern Red Sea in a previously unexplored area. The shipwreck appeared out of the murk totally by chance. The scientists launched a remotely operated vehicle to check out the unexpected wreckage, not wanting to pass up the potential for a new archaeological discovery. But according to Maddie Rodriguez, that was when the unthinkable happened. In her own words, she said she will never forget what happened next for as long as I live. From out of nowhere, a huge sea creature came into view, looked directly at the ROV, and then curled its body around the broken bow of the shipwreck. It was like something out of an underwater horror movie. At first, the researchers thought they were dealing with a giant squid. But this is the Red Sea, not the bottom of the Mariana Trench. They weren't actually able to confirm the identity of the monster until a year later, with help from the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. The creature was a purple back flying squid in giant form. Typically, these creatures are only about two feet long, but this one was nearly triple that. A very real sea monster, the Cambrian Roomba. The Titanochorus was one of the largest ocean predators of the Cambrian period which lasted from 543 to 490 million years ago. While not around anymore, it is a sea monster of note just for how terrifying it was almost half a billion years ago. The creature had a massive shield for a head, had claws that it used to rake through sand, and its circular mouth was filled with teeth. Scientists say it swept across the bottom of the ocean, slurping up prey like a Roomba, the robotic vacuum cleaner. So how big was this prehistoric behemoth? 
a whopping two feet long. That may not sound very big, but it's the largest seafloor predator that we know about from this period of time. Jean-Bernard Caron from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, the person involved with the creature's recent discovery, called it absolutely mind-boggling. All other lifeforms at the time were pipsqueaks compared to the Titanochorus. This is one of the reasons it succeeded as a predatory vacuum. Because it was so much bigger than all the other critters, it could pretty much eat whatever it wanted by just opening its mouth. Almost like a modern blue whale and the tiny krill it eats. Drone footage of the Loch Ness Monster The Loch Ness Monster has just been sighted, allegedly, by a British outdoorsman paddling through Loch Ness in Scotland. This time, the sighting was done totally by accident. The outdoorsman, Richard Mavor, was using his drone to capture some footage of a charity canoe trip when the monster showed up in the video. According to Richard himself, the last thing he wanted to do when he went to the lake that day was find the Loch Ness Monster. He's called himself something of a skeptic, though he's also admitted there is something strange in his footage. It's not a clear picture of the Loch Ness Monster. Whatever it was had been under the surface when the drone did a flyover. It looks more like an enormous snake than anything. While it appears as though it could be some kind of large sea snake, to some it might look like a prehistoric reptile with flippers. In any case, whatever the thing was, it was lurking a few feet from the water's edge, twice the size of the canoes. It never emerged, so there was no way to see its whole body. But for 2021, this was by far the best sighting of Nessie yet. Do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Let me know your theories in the comments below and thanks for watching! Remember to hit that subscribe button and come back soon for more amazing videos! See you later! Bye!